Good evening. Appreciate you making it again to Meet the Scientist. My name is Reed Corbett. I'm the Executive Director here at the Coastal Studies Institute. And tonight I am with Dr. David Lagomasino. We appreciate him joining us in the hot seat. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to let you know that our summer camps are taking place this summer. And we do have a few slots open. We are running those COVID safe. We have a fewer number of slots, but we do have a few more slots open, so get to those quickly. Also, we will continue running our Meet the Scientist as we move forward. Next month, we have George Bonner, who is the executive director of the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program. So join us next month for that Meet the Scientist. But for tonight, welcome David Lagomasino, Thank or you. just Lagomasino. Which has, one. as good. I lovingly call you. I've actually known David for several years now, <laughs> and he's been in the hot seat in front of me before, but it was a different hot seat. And maybe we'll talk about that as well. <laughs> anyway, David come to, comes to us from Florida, from Maryland, from different awesome. degrees, from different backgrounds. He'll talk about him being a space cadet um, with a, some really interesting background, grounded in geology, um, but working from space, which is kind of interesting. Um, David does have a geology degree from FIU, a master's from ECU, mm -hmm. yep. and then his PhD again mm -hmm. in geological sciences, sciences, I believe from, from, FIU. from yep. Florida International University. Yep. So well-grounded in geology, but interesting what we're talking mm -hmm. about tonight is remote sensing Same. and a lot of work actually from space, although you haven't been to space. No, no, no. To be clear. Not, not yet, not yet. To be clear. Right. So, yeah, let's, let's start with how that sort of, you know, your sort of trajectory, right? I mean, I, you have some traditional degrees, but I don't think your path was as traditional as some. No, so. it, it, it wasn't traditional at all. Um, when I started college, I was, I was bent on being a, uh, a medical doctor, actually. I wanted to study neurosurgery and for my entire life going into college I was like I'm gonna be a, a, a surgeon um, then I went to college and those first few semesters uh, <laughs> you know though I, I it's a transition it, it is a transition I, I enjoyed my classes but I realized that medicine wasn't my path and so the next year I spoke with my my advisor and then I sort of flip-flopped through a number of different majors. I went to mathematics, I went to physics, I went to education, hmm. and I even went to music. Um, so jumping all around. Um, but then I took a, an intro to geology course at, at Florida International University um, with a professor that I, I won't forget his name, Neptune Shramal. <laughs> um, wow. Kind of funny <laughs> to think about it now, but yeah. uh, I had that class and, it, and something just, it clicked and from then on out, I tried every opportunity I could get to, to be outside, to do field work in rocks at the time. Uh, that's when I first left Miami and, and went to out west to actually see some real rocks. Um, as part of a traditional field camp? As part of, we didn't have the field camp, it was more of a, a field week. Okay. Uh, so right. it was like during spring break that we went out, and that was right. the first time I really got to see rocks. And then from then on out, so I was like, I need to, to do this. Um, and so after I finished my, my bachelor's at FIU, um, I was like, I, I need to do, to do more. Um, and so I knew I wanted to do something coastal. Uh, I grew up you know, in Miami on a boat for, for most of my life. Right. Uh, and so um, I started looking for, for schools. ECU oh. sort of caught my eye. I and you spoke picked some incredible to, advisors. I spoke to someone interesting, and uh, <laughs> and that's when I I came up to ECU um, and started doing research out, actually not too far from here in the right. in the the wetlands out here. Um, from there, it was like oh, some cool stuff in terms of sedimentology, right? So adding that sort of ge other sort of geology component to that to look at sediment deposition. Um, I finished up here, again, with some amazing uh, oh, stop. <laughs> amazing <laughs> advisors. Um, and then I went back to FIU. Um, and this is where that sort of um, uh, the NASA connection kicked in. 
So it was a PhD program that was fully funded uh, through this sort of minority and underrepresented um, STEM program that was funding a number of PhDs at, at Florida International University. Um, and so um, being a, a, a first generation Cuban American, I was able to apply for this, this position and that's what sort of started this, this connection with NASA. And that sort of switched my research direction too. So I left some of the sediments and I started looking at groundwater and surface water interactions, again in coastal wetlands and, and mangroves in particular. Um, this was in the Everglades. This was in the Everglades and in, in Mexico as okay. well. So I did a sort of comparative analysis between the two regions. Um, but I had to use, it was NASA funded, so I was using remote sensing. Um, so satellite imagery to look at these changes on, on the landscape. Yeah, so remote sensing, right? So sort of define that broadly. <laughs> Uh, so the, the general sort of definition of that is, is being able to take a measurement without sort of being there, right? Making an observation of a place and not being there. And that's traditionally from either an airborne, from an airplane, or a, a satellite. Right. Um, and so that's taking, you know, certain types of measurements from these platforms, and we can use that to make these observations on the ground. And so you mentioned that it was your PhD that got you involved with NASA. So that was my reference to a space cadet, no offense to you, of course. Um, and from there, your PhD, after you received your PhD, that's where your connection with NASA came in. Is that right? Um, in, to some sense, right. So I, was, uh, I did a, a few inter internships during the summer during my PhD and, and made this connection with, with Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, it's uh, one of the, the NASA centers just outside Washington, D.C., um, and so I, I was doing a number of, of summer internships up there, and then after I graduated, that's when I've actually had the opportunity, I applied for a job, and there was a position open. Um, they do it as sort of these contractor, kind of a postdoc position right. there, um, and that's where things sort of even took off even more in terms of remote sensing, and that's where I learned a lot more of computer programming, and into more of the technolog uh, technological side of things, learning about the new sensors, um, and, and being able to take what I learned from my, my, my master's and <clears throat> my, my PhD, all that sort of geology, and bring that to, to NASA and mm -hmm. actually look at the system in a more, uh, much more holistic way. So one of the things um, is I find interesting, and I think I like to point these out, because for our listeners, I think it's important to make these connections. Some of the connections you made and, and your <clears throat> interest, I think, came from some of the internships you had. And so taking, making, taking the initiative and getting those internships helped further down the road. Right, and, and it was making sure I put myself in those opportunities, right. right? When I would either apply for those opportunities or if something came up, I would jump on it like, I need to do this, this is what's gonna help me later on. And so yes, there was that sort of connection. Um, I was working with a different group that I did my internships with, so it wasn't right. the same folks, but definitely having sort that. Sort of expanding your network. Exactly, yeah. and so that's where it helped to, to have those connections, but it, it wasn't just like given to me, right? It was, it was I had to go for it and I had to succeed and find those opportunities, but making those connections definitely did help. Yeah, and so you were working with NASA, sort of a contract employee with NASA. Today you're, an assistant professor in the Department of Coastal Studies out here on the Outer Banks campus with the Coastal Studies Institute. So what brought you back to North Carolina? I mean, other than the job, it had to be more than just the job. <laughs> no, no, it was, an, it, it was um, you know, I think one of the, the really cool things about being a coastal scientist is one, making sure that you get to do cool coastal things. And I mean, you can see it almost in the background here. We are in a great position to study coastal processes. Um, I think other, other things that sort of drew me in was the interdisciplinarity that's here at the Coastal Studies Institute. So, you know, at NASA, everyone does remote sensing in, in our department. Folks were focused on different parts of remote sensing um, or different sort of environments, but we all relatively did the, the same right. types of work. Um, and so what was kind of interesting about coming here was being able to work across the hall from an anthropologist or a sociologist or an, an economist or even, you know, biologist, fisheries persons and all of these other people that I didn't have as much interaction with at NASA. I, just a note, you didn't say a geochemist. 
anyway. <laughs> um, so your specialty in remote sensing. One of the things I find really interesting in your work is that you know, we've sort of defined remote sensing, but the tools that you use and you know, sort of the scales of those tools, right? From looking at centimeter scale to looking at global scale processes. And so maybe just speak a little bit about how remote sensing can be used to understand coastal systems and maybe the scales at which you're looking at things. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. So I'll, I'll start from space first, right? So there's a number of different satellites that are, that are orbiting the Earth. Um, they're all measuring different parts of uh, either the atmosphere or the Earth's surface. Um, and, you know, these are collecting data everywhere. And so, you know, and some sensors have been collecting data for over 40 years. And so what we're able to do from that is, is look at these spots that we don't really get to see every day. Um, and so we're talking about these global scales where we can look at these particular spots and see what's changing over, um, you know, over decades um, and in spots that we are not seeing every day. So bring that then down to sort of the airplane and we're then just flying over some more local areas or regional areas. Um, and we're getting a slightly higher resolution. So think about you know, taking a picture far away from something and then coming a little bit closer and taking a picture, right? You get more, much, much more resolution from that. Then you, know, you can start to look at you know, a, a little bit more detail, but then take one step closer, then you have your ground remote sensing technologies. And so what we're using here is, is you know, terrestrial laser scanners and, um, and sort of drone imagery to get that really fine scale detail uh, of, right, as you sort of mentioned, that centimeter scale right. or, or less in some cases detail of, of the landscape. So in the case for some of the spots in the Outer Banks, right, we can start to look at you know, uh, individual footprints in, in the sand and really start to look at you know, how those kind There's of things change. There's a poem there somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, that's, so we, there is this whole thing of scale, right? Um, there are really high resolution imagery that we can get from space. There's a trade, there's a bunch of trade-offs that we start talking about in terms of, um, you know, the, the resolution that we're getting from different imagery, the size of that file, right? The bigger the size, the bigger the computer that you need to be able to process things. Right. Um, and so there are some trade-offs in terms of, of that, and that's what I teach in some of my classes here. And, and so one of the things I, I didn't mention, and you brought up, was the idea that not only can you look at very variations in spatial scale, but temporal scales, right? So you mentioned footprints, right? And one of the things that you talked about, and we've talked about previously, is, is looking at the impact of just people potentially on beaches, or you know, using some of these tools like the terrestrial laser scanner to evaluate the implication of trampling the beach and how that might influence a beach. Or, you know, I know you've taken some imagery of the, the vessel, you know, near Oregon Inlet and of Jeanette's Pier. And so, I mean, you can look at very fine scale changes in space, but also in time. So, you know, how we might use these remote sensing techniques to, to think about management or you know, some of the research questions that, that you draw upon. And you know, I'm curious, you know, what are some of those things that you are actually measuring, right? So some of it, I, you know, we've shown some images of just you know, pictures, pictures right, yeah. that you can get from remote sensing, but right. you're looking at specific things. And, and so maybe talk a little yeah. bit about some of those questions, those research questions you're addressing. Right, um, so we can do a, a lot of things with the, this type of imagery. And so one of, one of the things that I've primarily focused on is, is coastal wetlands. Um, so I mentioned a little bit of the, of the marshes that we have, let's say, here in North Carolina. But if you go a little bit further south, let's say about to St. Augustine, that salt marsh switches to mangrove forest. <clears throat> and so I've focused a lot of my, um, uh, my career on, on mangrove forests and looking at how they, how they change. They're very important ecosystems for a number of reasons. Um, and that could be a whole set of talks there. Sure. Um, but we're looking at how these ecosystems are changing over time and, and the reasons why. So the sort of the who, what, where, when, and why we're seeing these changes. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we've done a global analysis of global mangrove loss and said, well, 
this is much uh, attributed to extreme events, or this has been attributed to um, the conversion to commodities, so shrimp farms or, or rice paddies. Um, and so we can actually put a number on that. And so you know, instead of just kind of having, oh yes, we've lost a lot, we can actually say, no, 60% of mangrove loss has been associated with, with humans. Um, and how that may change your ecosystem and your fisheries, right? Those are all things that we're sort of following up on. So that's on the mangrove side of things, but we're also um, you know, using uh, satellites to look at gold mining in, in Ghana. Um, and so looking at the effects of, of the conversion of, of agricultural lands to gold mining and what that means for runoff and what that means for the coastal ecosystems. Um, we're also looking at the impacts uh, of COVID and what COVID has on, on the movement of people. And so this is a, a project with some colleagues at, at MIT um, and looking at you know, the effects of, of uh, changes in shipping traffic or air mm. quality uh, or night lights. These are all things that are different types of satellite that we can actually make measurements on. And so we're actually measuring the impact of the pandemic on our movement. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, the, the breadth of data that can be collected through these tools, assuming you know how to use them, right? Assuming you know how to use them. And, and I, you know, every tool has its limitations. Every tool and technology has challenges. And so when you think about some of the, the tools that you, you use in, in your research, what are some of the limitations or challenges or, you know, in your research that you're doing, um, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a real good question. So for, I'd say for some of the remote sensing things, particularly from a satellite perspective and someone that studies the Earth's surface, um, clouds are actually a, a challenge. <laughs> um, and so, you know, Something for some people, control. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, some people love looking at the clouds, but for, for my <laughs> stuff, right, we, we need to be able to remove that. And so, oh. um, you know, I would say probably about when I was doing my, my PhD, at, you know, a little over, uh, about a decade ago, remote sensing and access to satellite data was, was much more difficult and you had to just get one or two images and that's how you, you kind of were able to do stuff. But now we're getting more to an opportunity of, of cloud computing and those types of things. So the challenges of getting data and doing some of the data processing is now going to the cloud to help us actually do some more of that um, heavy computation. So that's been, you know, there, there's these ideas of clouds um, but there are new sensors that are also, and, and I guess some older sensors too, that are, allow us to actually penetrate through those clouds. So radar, uh, a radar sensor in space can penetrate through those clouds and give us a nice shot of, um, of the, the Earth's surface. And so that can be able to use, um, use that information to fill in the gaps where clouds might be an issue. So, you know, we work a lot in the tropics, so there are many spots in in Colombia, in, in Nigeria, and in Indonesia that are, it's hard to get a good satellite <laughs> image because they're just perpetually right. cloudy. Right. Um, and so that's where, you know, using, um, you know, the, the, time, the full sort of time series of satellite data, we can really, you know, start to make some um, better maps of changes across the world. And so, um, let me just remind people that if you have questions, certainly put those in the chat. We'll get to those towards the end. Um, you know, with, with all of these, these tools available, one of the things that I think you're a bit passionate about is trying to get data out there and available, right? And, you know, there's a lot of data being collected, and it's incredible how much is actually freely available. Um, you know, can anybody just go and track this stuff down? Can anybody do your job? <laughs> Actually, I'd like to know that. <laughs> um, with the right training, yes, anybody could, could do it, right? Um, and so, you know, being, being at NASA, they had a very sort of open source type of thing, right? A lot of their um, computer models and algorithms are open source, so freely available. And a lot of the data itself is freely available. You can go out today, go to the to a lot of these uh, digital archives and download satellite data, right? right? So anybody could do that, but understanding the nuances of the technologies and what they're actually collecting and how to do the processing, that's where you need a bit of training. Um, but you know, with that right training, 
someone in high school can actually get this data, start um, you know, analyzing that data with, with um, you know, scientifically sound algorithms and produce some amazing data. And that's what you know, some interns of mine have, have been able right. to so do. Right, so you've had that. An, a high school intern that's no longer in high school, but has mm -hmm. recently published a scientific peer review paper, right? Yep. And yeah. that was somebody that started with you in high school. She started as uh, in the summer of her eighth grade going into wow. a freshman in high school. Yeah. Um, and so this was when I was at NASA, but we had her on for, for four years and, you know, working with her closely. And yeah, she was able to, you know, with supervision and, and mentorship, she was able to, you know, pull that data, analyze that data um, with, again, sort of scientifically sound models and algorithms. Hmm. Um, it was submitted for uh, a journal in a, in a relatively well-known journal, um, peer-reviewed, and, you know, we had to take it back and, <laughs> and edit it and all the stuff you have to do in the peer review process. Sure. But eventually it was, you know, published, and, and it's, it's, you know, a really good paper that is... is um, for the mangrove community and coastal community, a very important sort of step forward in understanding um, the impacts of, of climate and humans on the coastal landscape. Yeah. And so you've done a, a lot of work with mangroves, and you've mentioned some of the other work that you've done um, around the globe, which I want to come back to. I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you're thinking about your work and in North Carolina. Right? You, you did your master's in North Carolina. You're familiar with the North Carolina coast and some of the challenges and, and a lot of its, its beauty and interest mm -hmm. as well. And so I'm curious, you know, how you see applying some of your skills and, you know, your understanding of these systems to what we're looking at here in North Carolina. Yeah, so I think, you know, the pandemic's definitely slowed some sure, things down, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's probably some people here in the Outer Banks that have seen me take the terrestrial laser scanner out. <laughs> who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, who is that? What, what is he doing what out is there? That? Um, so I've gone out to the, the Ocean Pursuit. So a sort of recent shipwreck out here, um, taken the scanner out and, and um, been able to go back a few times to really, you know, sort of answer that question like, is it sinking right. or is it just sort of being, being buried? Um, and so we're, we're starting to look at that and understand, you know, the, the effects of shipwrecks on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, right? We are the right, graveyard the of the Atlantic, right? So what does that mean for those sediment dynamics, right? Um, as well as we're also using some satellite data to look at, um, you know, I will call them space lasers um, <laughs> that are, uh, can measure, um, the, the water level or can measure sort of wave dynamics or even the bathymetry in some areas. And so this is what we're, um, you know, what I would like to sort of bring here because this is a, an excellent spot um, to do a lot of those sort of coastal dynamics. I mean, we're a mix, we are a barrier island uh, with, you know, natural dunes, but also sort of modified yeah, dunes sure. as yeah. well, right? Yeah. And so that's this sort of connection between people in the landscape and, you know, being able to better um, understand what's happening so we can respond to it better, right? So where to best nourish the beach, right? Or, uh, or where we need to protect maybe some marshes from being eroded. And so this is where that satellite data comes in um, to be able to do a lot of that. Yeah. And again, the spatial scale allows you to look at it in different times, mm -hmm. spatial scales. And so it's an incredible data set, incredible resource. So going back to, you know, sort of the, some of the exciting things about our job is, well, you know, the freedom to study those areas, those questions that we have real interest in. Um, but that's sort of taken you to all, all sorts of places around the globe. M not all continents yet. Not all continents, but, but a lot of, ma many of them, A lot yes. of interesting places. So I'm yes. curious, um, some of your, maybe your two favorite Ooh, and why? Two favorite. Well, where and why? <laughs> you got to tell us. Uh, where. So it's a, it's a number of spots that I've been to in terms of it's a lot of stuff with my with my mangrove research. Um, I'll say probably one of my favorites because it was the whole experience um, was actually going to Gabon. So Gabon is a is a country sort of um, it's in West Africa, and if you kind of think of of that sort of bend around, it's kind of right there in that center, and it's almost like right at the equator. Um, 
these have some of the, the tallest mangrove forests in the world. They're uh, towering at 60 meters, so you're thinking almost 200 feet tall wow. mangroves, and these um, prop roots are well above your head. And um, so yeah. amazing. When I think of mangroves, I think of what we see in the Everglades, Everglades which are 20, 20 meters, so about 60 feet or yeah. so. Um, so these are huge, huge, um, towering sort of trees. Um, and so what was interesting about that is like, not only was it sort of the, a cool spot in terms of understanding uh, mangrove forest structure, um, but we were actually sort of camping in these local villages that lived in the mangroves. And mm. so we, we were working very closely with, with uh, a university in, in the capital there in Libreville and with the sort of local communities. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, going into the mangrove forest and then coming back to the mangrove forest to go to sleep. <laughs> um, but it was, it was amazing and being able to, to um, see how um, folks use those resources, right? I mean, that's, that's, right. that's their livelihood. They're fishing in it. They're, they're using the, the wood to, to build their homes um, or to, to fuel their, their, um, their kitchens, right? right. Um, so seeing that was really, really interesting. And, and I'll, I'll get, give you the, the opportunity to give me your second, but to sort of play on that is, you know, one of the things that I, I've seen in a lot of your work and the imagery and the videos is how you bring the people into what you're doing as well. It's not just, you know, you and your NASA colleague going halfway around the world, doing your studies and leaving. I mean, you do bring local knowledge into your own research, bring that knowledge that you gain to the locals as well. Right, and, and that's definitely a, a, a passion of mine and a passion of the, of the groups that I've, I've worked with is that we aren't not just going in, collecting data and getting out. No, we're actually working with those local communities we're, we're, um, and, and universities, right? So we get right. many students involved um, uh, and, and hold sort of like impromptu classes during all of this, right? And so we'll go out to the field, we'll collect some, some soil samples or something, but I'll start talking through like, this is what that means. And uh, maybe even showing, we bring, uh, you know, some, um, uh, little worksheets and stuff sometimes to, to you know, teach them as as well, and they're in you know with us for two weeks out in the in the mangrove forest camping, um, and you know we're learning from them because they have their specific sort of local knowledge and what they're using it for and what it, the importance of these systems to them. Um, but we're also sort of, you know, providing, you know, why we're there. This is why it's important to us. And so it, it's a bit of a dialogue and exchange and um, learning from each other. Right. And, that, you know, and I think that's critical wherever you are, right? We try to do the same thing here on the Outer Banks with what we do at the Coastal Studies Institute. All right. Second place. I'll give you a two. <laughs> uh, second place. Um, goodness. Uh, I would say the second place would probably be Colombia. Um, so this was actually my first uh, trip to, to South America, and um, we flew into to Medellin, so the, the um, kind of the big city in, in Colombia, um, and we took a little puddle jumper plane, <laughs> maybe fit like 10 people, just like the team and a few others. We flew over the Andes, and in this little, <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> in this little puddle jumper, and we went to this, this community um, called Nuki. And so they're right on the Pacific coast of, of Colombia. Um, fairly small sort of village, you know, about a thousand people or so. But you can just imagine if we were crossing over the Andes, right, this community is, is um, really disconnected from the rest of, say, rest of the world, right? right. Definitely rest for the, of the country. And so they um, rely almost exclusively on the resources that they have at the coast. And a lot of that coming from the mangrove forest as, as well. Um, and so what was nice about this one is it was a, um, you know, a really cool sort of community, community to, to work with. And, and um, we did have some challenges. This is one of the things that, you know, this was one of my first sort of international field campaigns. Um, and making sure that we were working with the community. And so... Um, when we got there, we needed to make sure that we spoke to uh, El Jefe, the, right, the chief of the village, 
and and work with them and bring in the village elders and, and say like this is why we're here this is what we want to do we want you involved we want you seeing the process <clears throat> so that was really kind of where that sort of uh, <clears throat> or part of that sort of connection came from but again we're sort of seeing the the locals using those resources right um, that's where it was like man this is this is cool stuff. Like this is why it's important, right? If we think about the Everglades, it's like, oh yeah, it's a great spot to recreate in, right? right. So we'll go right. fishing, and um, but when you actually see the folks actually using those resources yeah, and under used. how long they've been doing that for, right? So. And so before we get to questions, I wanted to bring up one more topic, um, and one of the things that when 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 you came here and interviewed was I thought was really exciting was the way you were connecting art and science and one of the things that you just mentioned earlier is when you first went to college you were hitting on all of these other th <laughs> like music you mentioned one yes, and, and so yeah. anyway that just sort of made a connection in my mind when you just started talking and so I mean you you did bring science and music together in some of your own work or some of your collaborative work and I maybe just speak to that briefly because I think that's really important for one. It's a way that we can really translate some of what we do and, and you've, you know, you've done that and I think that's really interesting. Yeah, and, and so you, you mentioned it there, it's like translating that, that scientific material, that scientific information that can sometimes be um, either you know, complicated or, or you know, a, a barrier against sort of uh, communication. And so, you know, some of the this sort of fun collaboration I, I did while I was at, at, at NASA um, was actually turn satellite imagery into music. And so, um, you know, there are different um, sort of, we'll call it a bands that come from the, the imagery and, and we were able to sort of make a computer program that would say, well, if it's this color, play this, this note. Um, and so we were able to really hear the sound of environmental change, right? right. As you move from, let's say, water to a forest or water uh, to an urban area, you could actually hear the music do right. that. And everybody um, learns differently. And everyone and learns so, different, right. So this is where you can sort of use that to communicate, mm -hmm. um, you know, something that might be a bit complicated, but you can put it in a, in a bit um, easier language, right. um, but even sort of reaching out to folks with disabilities as well, yeah. right? So for them to sort of also hear an image, right? And, and so then they can sort of interact with that satellite data in their own way. Mm -hmm. And I think, and it, again, any way that we can take our data, right, and translate it, articulate that in different ways, I think is really important. So I, yeah. I thought that was really awesome. I wanted people to hear about that. All right, so a couple questions before we wrap it up, since you are in the hot seat. All right, so here's a question. Is insurance industry interested in your research applications to better understand coastal risks? Is insurance it? Um, so the, there has been an increase in terms of um, being able to understand where communities might be more vulnerable um, to, let's say, storm surge or, or disasters, right? Hurricanes or those types of things. Um, so there's a, you know, an increasing sort of movement of, of insurance companies to, to look more at this sort of spatial information and, and the imagery and, and the history that we kind of get from that satellite data. Um, I'm not too aware of, of the actual sort of full connection yet, um, but I know there is sort of movement to be able to say, um, yes, this area is a bit more vulnerable, we need to you know, look at the way um, insurance is, is sort of allocated for those particular areas. The application of your work towards management and coastal systems. Um, That's a pretty broad question. I mean... It, it is. And, and so I, we are working toward that. Um, let's say, for example, a lot of our, our mangrove work, um, we work closely with um, the Global Mangrove Alliance. And so this is a sort of international alliance of, of some of the larger sort of NGOs and even smaller sort of conservation organizations um, and working with them to use this satellite data to know um, what's the rest of restoration potential of a particular area, what might be best to um, or better suited to restore in this way 
and this other spot might have another way of restoration, right? So restoration doesn't always look the same, and we need to know what that environment is before we start planting mangroves in a spot that's eroding. Um, and so being able to, to use that satellite information to help inform uh, management, one, is gonna make it a much more effective restoration and conservation strategies. Um, but we don't lose money in terms of, well, we planted in the wrong spot, it's just eroding right. away. And so that's where we are definitely connected with, with managers. Um, you know, mentioned a lot of stuff in the Everglades. We work closely with the National Park Service down there sure. as well. All right, what everybody wants to know is, is the ocean pursuit sinking or is it being buried? Uh, both. <laughs> it's a little bit of both, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, we've probably hit some sort of buoyancy kind of at this point. Um, and so, um, but we still have a, a bit more to go, right. but you can probably see it every day. It's, it looks a little bit it different. Does, yes. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know soon. All right. Sounds good. We look forward to talking with David Moore in the future. We appreciate you sitting in the hot seat. Enjoyed the conversation. Um, hold on. One question just came in. How do you decide whether one research topic is worth doing or not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> one research topic is worth doing or not. Um, I would say it, it's um, something that I would sort of have to be passionate about, right? Um, and certain topics, you know, click with me more. Uh, and, you know, not to say that other things aren't important, right? But they're definitely things that, oh, you know, my passion is for coastal ecosystems and coastal wetlands in particular. So I definitely want to focus a bit on that. But knowing there's a whole bunch of cool stuff out there to definitely Yeah, and you never on. know where it's going to take you either. Never I mean, that's know the one thing it. that's really interesting. You never know research. where the seas will take you. There, there you go. And with that, <laughs> thank you everybody for joining us. Again, next month we have George Bonner, director of our Ocean Energy Program. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. All right. Thank you.